did actually want to take a bit of time, I suppose, in the discussion to focus on what I think was the defining, certainly political event of the year, uh, which was Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine, as, as you alluded to, Eileen. And um, I suppose um, for that, we're absolutely delighted to be joined by, by Dunica, of course, who's one of the, uh, if not the leading expert on uh, Eastern European politics within Ireland. Um, you alluded to this, Eileen, but I mean, how did we get it so wrong uh, on this? Because I know, I know there were so many different uh, assessments. Some people were saying, you know, it, it will, it will happen. Putin will mount the invasion, and then others, you know, people who were well respected in the intelligence community and um, within the political community, also saying um, that this wasn't going to happen and that this was just uh, more saber rattling. How, um, in particularly in that section, did we get it so wrong? Well, yeah, I mean, this time last year, we were all thinking about what Putin wanted, as Eileen said, that there was a mass mobilization around Ukraine, and the question was, will he, won't he? And Eileen is absolutely right. I mean, like, if we had listened to the neighbours, I mean, when you're going looking for, to buy a house, what do you do? You always ask the neighbours what the, what the people living in the house are like. Um, if we'd asked the neighbours and listened to the neighbours in Latvia and Poland and Estonia, uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. I mean, Nord Stream 2, this pipeline that connects Germany directly to Russia, which will never open, uh, it seems, uh, was, uh, you know, finalised after the war started in Ukraine, because this is, February wasn't the beginning of the war in Ukraine, this was an escalation of a war that started in 2014. And there was a Faustian pact in Europe, people didn't want to believe, because they had a, an interest in not believing that Putin would do what he wanted to do. Uh, that he was, as, and, and there was all the evidence there, you, you, even going back to when he became president. I mean, he was blooded in Chechnya, it was his first war. He was barely a wet week uh, in the Kremlin when he, he, he sought to annihilate the Chechen people, a small people, you know, less uh, in, in size and population than, uh, than Dublin. And, uh, and then, of course, there was the war in Georgia in 2008. There was, of course, Crimea and Donbass in 2014. There was Syria. So, there, you know, there was a lot of evidence there. And, and then there was the saber rattling, yes, uh, around Ukraine. But why we got it so wrong in Europe collectively, as I said, it was, it was largely because Europe had got itself, particularly uh, a certain select coterie of countries, had got itself into a dependency on, on, on Russian energy and, and had refused to believe uh, that Putin would. Uh, the, the, the notion in German, there's a German phrase, which I, I don't speak German, so I can, I'll only give you the English rendering, but it's, it's something like, you know, change through engagement. I mean, that somehow Russia would change by this, this engagement uh, and this business uh, with Europe. So, so yeah, I mean, Europe has a lot to answer for, uh, but Europe has um, collectively tried to, I guess, catch up now. Um, and um, energy is, is, is a big part of it. I mean, we have to find alternative sources of energy and alternative, um, you know, types of energy. Uh, it's it's, it's, it's uh, another, I told you so, I guess, are those who've been arguing for green energy because most, most of the sources of energy are from autocratic powers. And even the, the, the countries that are looked at to replace Russia are also autocratic dictatorships, just perhaps less threatening to, 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 to Europe in, in terms of territorial uh, imperialism. So, so yeah, Europe is in a difficult place. This is ultimately uh, a war, not just a, a, about Ukraine. It's, it's about a much larger issue. It's, it's, it's an issue that involves Europe as a whole. It's one of a democracy, uh, imperfect as it was and is, uh, against a dictatorship. I mean, Ukraine has had five changes of government in the last 20 years, whereas Putin has remained in power during that period as a dictatorship. So, um, you know, people are always asking, you know, can Ukraine win this war? Uh, and, 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 and I often say that Ukraine has to win this war. I mean, it, it, it's it's not least for the Ukrainian people themselves. I think when the war began back in February, I remember it very well, I had a friend from Ukraine staying with me in Glasnevin, and he went back to Ukraine three days before the war broke out. Nobody thought this was going to happen. I think all of us thought that Ukraine would be overwhelmed within a couple of weeks. Um, what's remarkable is, is that 2022 is coming to an end and we've seen the liberation of, of Kharkiv. We saw them pushed back from Kiev. Remember when they, there was that 70 kilometer convoy outside Kiev? We've seen Kherson liberated. The, the military momentum certainly has been with Ukraine for some time, which is why now during this winter, Putin has sought to, to weaponize winter and, and to freeze the Ukrainian people into submission. Um, but I, I'm in daily contact with people in Ukraine. They certainly show no sign of, of, of giving in. And, and they certainly are confident. That, that's the big difference, I think, between now and February, is that you know, Ukrainians really believe that they can win. Um, they, 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 they have a Ukraine to look forward to. Uh, but what type of Ukraine emerges will largely depend on events in the coming months. 
Mm. And, and I suppose, given given your expertise more broadly in terms of um, Eastern Europe, obviously, of other countries, as you mentioned, uh, Georgia, um, you've Moldova there as well, obviously, um, at the at the front line of, of this war as well. Um, how has the war, do you think, changed the attitudes in these particular countries, uh, perhaps also with regard to uh, potential EU membership in the future? Well, certainly, I think Europe looks at Ukraine, at Georgia, at Moldova in a way that it didn't look, you know, before the war. Um, and and Ukraine, as you know, and Moldova now are candidate, have candidate status. They achieved that some months ago. Uh, Georgia has kind of a shopping list of things it needs to do to get that candidate status. Um, but the, the, the neighborhood as well perceive that Russia is is declining. As I mean, I lived in Central Asia for six years, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. They have lived under the shadow of the Kremlin for many years as well, and and their attitudes are are changing uh, because these are you know former parts of that Russian empire. So they also see Ukraine's victory as their victory because they fear that if Ukraine doesn't win, that you know they could be next uh, as well. Um, so, so no, I mean, it, it has had a huge impact. And I was in Georgia twice during the last month, and hundreds of thousands of Russians have fled to, to Georgia uh, since September, since that mobilization, mainly young people, mainly well-resourced. They're buying up property, renting accommodation, but they're the kind of people who, who never thought that they would be affected by this war. Um, you know, re relatively affluent, middle class, uh, technically adept, because there was an internal colonial dynamic to this war as well. We look at kind of the the Russia-Ukraine imperial dynamic, but within Russia, and it's the same mistake we used to make during the Cold War. I'm old enough to remember when we used to talk about the Soviet Union as if it was only Russia. Mm. Um, we do the same with Russia. Russia is made up of 150 different nations. You're 80 times more likely to be on the front line if you're from Buryatia than if you're from Moscow, even though Moscow is the most populous part. Uh, if you're from Dagestan, if you're from the North Caucasus. So they're, they're bringing up the ethnic minorities and pushing them into the meat grinder um, and it's only when that partial mobilization call came in September that people in, you know, relatively affluent parts of Moscow said, maybe I could be, maybe my children could be called to this war. So it has had a huge impact um, in, in not only in Ukraine, not only in Europe, but in the near abroad, as it's called, and within Russia. Yeah, and that was the next question I was going to ask you in terms of the impact that you think it's had uh, in Russia. And obviously, you know, people talk, is there the potential that there could be political change in Russia um, as a result of all of the, the families of the... The, the soldiers who've gone abroad to fight in Ukraine, who died, um, and that wider societal impact that it's had within Russia. They're, they're good. And, and if it happens, I think we, we won't get much advance notice in the same way that the Soviet Union collapsed so quickly uh, with a whimper rather than a bang, as everybody feared. Um, it, was, it was essentially when people lost confidence within the Soviet Union that the Soviet Union collapsed. Similarly, I think there's, there, there has been an ebbing away of Putin's support. I wouldn't underestimate, though, the level of support that he has traditionally enjoyed. War has, he has harnessed conflict in a way that has served his political ends in the past, but that's always because he chose relatively short, inexpensive, winnable wars. This doesn't have any of those characteristics, which is why he's under unprecedented threat. Dictatorships have much bigger risks than democracies when they go to war. Uh, democracies can go to war and lose. America, as we know, does it quite regularly. Um, you know, but if you're a dictatorship, think of Argentina in 1982 in the Falklands War. The dictatorship collapsed shortly after losing the Falklands War because dictatorships rely on coercion. They don't have democratic legitimacy. Um, so, you know, democracies usually are all, you know, there's a, there's a process whereby war is declared. Um, which has a certain degree of legitimacy. But when uh, dictatorships have this kind of monopoly of coercive power, and if they're perceived to be weak, and nothing gives you that impression more than defeat in a war, that's when they're most vulnerable. So unlike in a democracy, you know, people retire, they write their memoirs, they spend more time with their families. In dictatorships, usually it means losing everything, uh, including perhaps one's life and legacy. And Putin knows that. He's wagered everything on this war which is why for him, it's to the bitter end. But I, 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 having spoken with people in Russia and people who have fled Russia, they're not willing to, to wager everything on this war. Thank you. Interesting. Um, I suppose turning now to uh, one of the other topics that's been uh, very prominent, particularly, particularly in the last uh, number of months, uh, with obviously the World Cup in Qatar, which was uh, awarded back in 2010, uh, but has started recently, um, a lot of attention being drawn to uh, some of the human rights issues um, and some of the concerns, particularly around uh, migrant workers in Qatar. So I know, I know, Mark, uh, you're here today. Um, you you obviously have a lot of uh, experience covering um, issues around corruption within within football in particular. 
Um, so I wonder if you might speak to some of the some of the issues that we've seen in Qatar over the last while associated with the World Cup. Yeah, I think um, from Qatar's perspective, the the World Cup's been a absolute success for them. You know, in terms of bringing in you know fans from around the world, global eyes, you know, billions watching on TV. I think for FIFA, it's been an absolute disaster. You know, it's in terms of its reputation, just when you thought it couldn't get any lower after the Blatter era, we uh, era the er, era of errors. Um, we have G Gianni Infantino, you know, coming out on the eve of the World Cup saying, you know, today I feel Muslim, I feel gay, I feel like an immigrant worker, you know, and, you know, Blatter at the height of his uh, powers wouldn't have been, you know, showing such shuts back. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, in terms of uh, corporate sponsors or, you know, associations, um, you know, in, in Western Europe or in, um, in other parts of the world, you know, the, the, the reputation of FIFA has only sunk you know, through what's happened. And we've seen even, you know, with um, the arrest of uh, Eva Kali in recent days, the, the Greek MEP, the, one of the vice presidents of the European Parliament, um, that Qatar has been engaged in this global um, campaign of propaganda, um, re weaponizing propaganda. Like I, I had some experience with this myself. Um, a few years ago, I wrote a story highlighting the, how um, gay and transgender people will be treated, you know, and the, and the concerns that fans would have going from, you know, from Western Europe or America going to Qatar and how they'd be treated. And, you know, I immediately got a phone call from a PR agency in London rep who was uh, working for Qatar saying, you know, this is all Dubai black arts, that you're, you're swallowing the propaganda, trying to, you know, not addressing any of the issues. You know, like I think it, it, it was beyond time for a Muslim country um, to host the World Cup. It was beyond time for a Middle Eastern country to host the World Cup. But just the way it happened where it was undoubtedly wide-scale corruption that uh, FIFA senior um, officials were bribed. It's been shown quite clearly, you know, whistleblowers have come forward with, you know, overwhelming evidence that this happened. So, you know, we had Russia and then we had Qatar award the World Cup on the same night. Um, so, you know, FIFA has had many opportunities to reverse that decision, you know, and I think, you know, there was way more deserving countries like, you know, from the Muslim world, like Morocco, who we've seen their football team doing so well, you know, they bid the World Cups, but they didn't splash the cash like the Qataris did and stuff envelopes full of cash to uh, various FIFA delegates. So, yeah, I just think FIFA's reputation has been further sully. But I think, you know, for, as we've seen with uh, Putin and, you know, I would work in, in rehabilitating his reputation post-Crimea in 2018, that really worked, I think. And it, it helped maybe people see him in a, in a better light up until February of this year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for the Qataris, it's had a similar effect. You know, there is, it has had positive effects. Obviously, look, Everyone's aware of the issues, but how they treated globe, uh, the immigrant workers, you know, they're, they're not unusual in how they treat um, LGBT community, but it's, it's good that can be highlighted. But I think, you know, a, a lot of what they said has just been propaganda, you know, and uh, unfortunately, I think it's worked. You know, it's, it's now more of a destination. It's, you know, it's seen in the same kind of uh, realm as Dubai and, and the UAE. So I think it's been a success for them. And unfortunately, it's, it's further sullied the, the beautiful game. And, and look, on the football side, it's been... Uh, it's been an amazing World Cup, and I'm one of those people. You know, I'm sick to the back, my back teeth about how it was awarded, but I, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to turn away and not watch the football, unfortunately. Well, I mean, That's, and, they, and they know that, you know. Yeah, well, no, exactly. I was going to ask you: Do you think football is is permanently damaged by this, or do you think it will it will survive? I think it's lost a lot of people. You know, who'd be you know, I'm a diehard fan. I'd watch you know, um, you know, any any team play another team. You know, like I'd, I'd watch Fit Harps play on a dark, cold night against uh, <laughs> Wexford. You know, um, so I'd watch any, any any kind of standard of football. But you know, seeing seeing like the likes of M Mbappe and Messi do their stuff is it's, it's I have to, you know it's compulsive stuff for me to watch. But I think yeah, it has damaged. Um, it has further sullied football's reputation. You know, and as a global game, and you know the standards. And they're not the only sport that's taken the the the, the dollar or the the oil money or the gas money. As we've seen with um, you know, all the sports washing that's happening with Middle Eastern money, whether it be Newcastle United or, you know, with the um, the golf tour as well, you know, so, um, but yeah, I, I think it's bad for FIFA's reputation and uh, bad, bad for football's overall reputation. And, you know, the fact that Infantino is the only candidate going forward for, um, the, you know, the, a new term just shows the the, the underwhelming um, nature of the, the talent and ambition that's there maybe to reform football, you know, that he, you know, he's someone that served under Michel Platini, who left in disgrace. And, you know, he's there and he's disgracing football, I think, every time he opens his mouth. And, you know, he, you know he's happy to sit, whether it be with uh, Mohamed Ben Salad or 
uh, uh, Putin and you know no one is going to run against him and say look I'm, I'm, I'm running on a clean ticket here because no one no one is clean in global football unfortunately yeah no, and it really is extraordinary to to reflect on the fact that the 2018 World Cup is held in Russia and now obviously in Qatar then in this year as well so and though I think the, the next one is, is USA Mexico and Canada so at least uh, I suppose less less controversial there but um, maybe turning to yourself now, uh, Patrick, another uh, event of the year which, uh, which got a lot of coverage, um, uh, particularly recently as well, um, and which got you kicked out of the Green Party uh, for a few months as well, was the um, legal challenge that you took against the uh, a Comprehensive European Trade Agreement, the trade agreement agreed between um, the EU and Canada. Um, so I, I suppose uh, the, the Supreme Court ruled uh, recently that it, it couldn't be implemented uh, into Irish legislation. The High Court had previously ruled um, against that particular finding. The Supreme Court overruled it. Um, I suppose, would you be able to elaborate on what you think are some of the necessary amendments that you think need to be made to CETA, or does it need to be scrapped entirely? Well, just to start, what got me thrown out of the party <laughs> was, <laughs> was voting on <laughs> the right way or was it the wrong way? The, host, or the, the, the host, yeah, attorney yeah. hostile voting the role not the way i was told let's put it that way uh some people tell me it was the right some people tell me it was the wrong way but it was the national maternity hospital that got kicked out of the party my legal challenge did annoy people and he's back in now yeah. I, I missed this but he's back in now two weeks ago um the legal challenge did annoy some people in the party but didn't get me kicked out okay. um and and I think I think I, I kind of want to take a moment as well, just before getting into the case. I think one of the things that's really important for me in terms of this case is what it actually shows about access to justice and an independent judiciary and how fundamental they are, you know. And I could talk for hours about that. I won't, you know, but I think we're going to see stuff around access to justice, judicial reviews, the planning reforms. In coming year time uh, months, we'll hopefully see stuff in civil legal aid as well. And these are really things, you know, there's not enough judges, there's not enough courtrooms, all of that. And that was kind of the ecosystem that allowed this case to even happen. So we're talking about, uh, you know, the importance of democracy and all of this. And and I think one of, for me, one of the big takeaways is how lucky we are to have a really strong rule of law in terms of our courts and independent judiciary. What should happen with CETA? What's the amendment that should happen with CETA? For me, I think what's the amendment is the amendment that happened to the Singapore trade deal. Um, I think it was 2017, and the Courts of Justice of the European Union said, because the Singapore trade deal contains trade elements, which are an EU competence, and investor courts, which are a member state competence, and it's a mixed deal, it must be ratified. And we broke these apart, We've ratified the trade elements of Singapore, or, well, they're happening. And we just seem to have shelved, put the, the, the courts element of the Singapore deal into a bottom drawer and forgotten about it. So I think, you know, the CETA is in provisional application. We're benefiting from the trade elements. Let's keep benefiting from them. And one of the other things I say, uh, reasons I say that is, part of the thing is, if any European country says we're never ratifying this, the whole thing's dead. Now, Cyprus has, has voted against it. Now, my understanding is if we if we change the treatment of halloumi cheese, um, they may change their minds. Yeah, big, big fan of halloumi cheese. But, you know, so, so they may change their mind. But the Germans have made moves to ratify it. And that's now being challenged in the German constitutional court. And that's incredibly slow. So you're not going to see anything out of them for three, four, maybe even five years. But if they come out the end and say, forget it, no, this is a breach of German law. It's done. Go away. German is ne Germany is never ratifying this. All the good stuff, it could be potentially lost at that point. You know, so I think we need to look at this as there are huge existential risks to see. So how do you... The trade elements that are in, in, in application at the minute, how do you protect them? And one of the ways is to try and renegotiate and separate this away. And if we look at the United States, Mexico, Canada Association Agreement, the replacement for NAFTA, Canada negotiated its way out of investor courts. The investor courts in that do not apply to Canada. So I don't, you know, maybe I'm being uh, an element of wishful thinking here, but... 
you know, it's not impossible to say Canada is all right making trade deals without investor courts. The European Union is all right making with them. And we like what we're doing in terms of trade. So let's protect that and stick with that. So, so obviously the government has said that um, it will make a, an amendment to the Irish legislation, um, which then it, it says um, it will proceed then with the ratification of the CETA trade deal. So you probably know what question I'm going to ask you next. Uh, if they do that, will you vote for the CETA trade agreement? Well, I'm on record already saying that I don't support investor courts and I'm not going to facilitate investor courts. Um, I think they're really dangerous to any government who wants to pass progressive legislation and wants to protect its independence. Um, and I think that's that's a bottom line. But also, I think that it's not going to be straightforward passing, uh, um, we're amending the Irish legislation. So the piece of legislation that was picked out by Mr. Justice Hogan was the Arbitration Act, which is about bringing, um, you know, transposing the Washington Convention and the New York Convention around international arbitration into Irish law. So if we start messing with the Arbitration Act or amending, that I should be perhaps more generous, if we amend the Arbitration Act, we may find ourselves outside of the remit of those two agreements. Equally, the amendment that Mr. Justice Hogan was saying was that the, the, we should amend it so that the Irish courts remain superior to all these other courts. That may not be possible because the whole point of these agreements is the Irish courts aren't superior and the Irish courts aren't in a position of oversight and the Irish courts aren't in a position to say, no, we're not enforcing this. The whole, to, to, it's to, the whole point is to take that away. So if you put that in to fix it, you then have this other problem, you know, that you're outside of the agreement of, of CETA as well. Um, and then even if you do fix that, as Mr. Justice Charlton said, sure, you can fix that. You address these, you know, points. I've got six other constitutional problems with this judgment and someone else could come along and it will be someone else can come along <laughs> and take that a, a, a challenge along even very similar lines to what I took. Now, the arguments are going to be different because the, 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 the legal landscape looks different. But I don't think amending the Arbitration Act is really quite as simple uh, uh, as, as the summary uh, judgment appears. And as I say, when you dig into Hogan's judgment, he'll take in one part, he'll give in one paragraph and he'll take in another. And then Mrs. Just, Mr. Just Charlton, who was the, uh, the one in the 6-1 decision that said, so it was 4-3 that they couldn't ratify, but 6-1 that you could just do the amendment. Uh, he has a lot more problems. And again, there's problems there in relation to um, our requirements as a member of the European Union. So even if we put in this, that those requirements of membership may counteract this. So it, it, it's, 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 it's kind of like trying to bring two positive charges of a magnet together. You know, it's just as you push one, the other moves further away. So it's not going to be straightforward. So uh, to sidestep all of that, let's just break away the investor courts and tuck them in a drawer somewhere. And there's, there may be another CJEU challenge, not for me, but I'll, I'll bore people with that afterwards. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to claim to be uh, claim to be a lawyer and, and uh, know enough to be able to, to respond on these, but perhaps some people um, in the room may have some, uh, some views on it. And, and I suppose just in general, um, if anyone has any questions or any uh, comments they'd like to make to the uh, to the panelists, uh, oh, please raise your hand. And yeah, just to say, like I again, I I was relying heavily on the legal expertise of my my barristers, so I must thank them and the support of the other half who didn't blink when I, you know, said we're going to sue the government and the house may be at risk. Um, so you know, I uh, I'll try and answer the legal questions as well, but you know. I may have to refer you to my senior counsel. <laughs> <laughs> well, not just legal questions, but questions on anything uh, that we've discussed so far. But um, I, I suppose uh, cycling back maybe to one of the other uh, defining events of the year um, was undoubtedly the 45-day uh, uh, premiership of Liz Truss, um, or rather the, uh, the lettuce uh, that lasted uh, longer than, than Liz Truss at that time. But um, one of the aspects that I found kind of particularly interesting about um, Liz Truss, and perhaps maybe not so much of a departure from Boris Johnson, who was perhaps a bit like this too, but um, I, I suppose it was 
a constant critique uh, on behalf of her and on behalf of the Conservative Party of media and journalists. Um, and I suppose it, it's we've more broadly seen it with, with Donald Trump previously in the United States and, and with the Republican Party. Um, and I, I suppose I wanted to go to you, Eileen, just to get your views uh, in relation to this, this particular point. Um, how have you seen uh, the relationship during your career uh, between um, politicians and the media and journalists change um, over, over your time uh, being involved in broadcasting? Well, I think Donald Trump and Liz Trust have done us all a great favour in, in, you know, in traditional sort of, with their fake news and stuff like that, that people are returning to a certain extent to the traditional media that they feel they can trust the traditional independent media. I think, I think it's more, it's the um, social platforms that are changing things more than traditional media. I mean, we, Donald was down in, in Europe <clears throat> at the Kennedy Summer School and there were a bunch of younger journalists there on the Saturday afternoon who were talking about tweeting and how they're encouraged to express their own opinions and all that. Now that's anathema to me, you know. As far as I'm concerned, you should never know how I feel about the story I'm reporting on. And if I start tweeting now in favour of one giving an opinion, what happens in two years' time when government has changed and it's all upended? Where's your credibility then? So that's what I'd be worried about in terms of the way that it's moving. Okay, very interesting. Mark, I wonder, do you have any... Yeah, on? like it's an extraordinary year um, with, in, in British politics. You know, we had the... We had the lunatics running the asylum, you know. So, um, you know, we thought Bo after Boris couldn't get any worse. And so then you had the likes of the Daily Telegraph um, and the Daily Mail and the Daily Express um, and kind of the new uh, broadcasting, you know, like um, UK uh, News UK. Or no, yeah, there was Talk TV and there's GB News. And this extraordinary campaign to row in behind uh, Liz Truss as the agreed, you know, con continuation Boris, continu continuity Boris uh, candidate. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I think um, and British media has been like this, unfortunately, for, and I, I, I recently left Sunday Times, which is a Murdoch-owned newspaper, and we were lucky enough in all the time I was there, I was at Sunday Times for 16 years, there was one issue that um, Rupert had any interest in in Irish politics, and that was an EU referendum on Lisbon, where he was very much, you know, I want the Sunday Times in Ireland to be the anti-Lisbon Treaty uh, party. That was the only, thankfully, it was the only thing he had, a, had an interest in. And now, Frank Gibbon, who was the editor, was happy. That was his uh, position as well. He had issues with the Lisbon uh, Treaty at the time. So the newspaper did campaign on that. But when it comes to uh, uh, politics, party politics, the Newspapers generally in Ireland do not get involved in the campaigning way that they do uh, with the Daily Telegraph, you know, which campaigns just vociferously for, you know, kind of the right wing um, one state, they call them conservatives. Um, so I, I think that really undermines traditional journalism because so, so much of their um, coverage is just laughable, you know, in, in terms of when it comes to politics, you know, the, the way they, they make Boris or they built Liz up to be this, you know, the new Thatcher. Um, it was just it just really undermines traditional journalism so it's not just you know i don't think it's just social media but I, but I see it in ireland as well um i can see there's young journalists you know who would be very uh pro finnegade or very pro Sinn Féin, and it's or, or maybe pro green party as well or and and they do, they they <laughs> like I, i'm the same with eileen I, I i wouldn't i think it's as a news reporter you do not put your politics yeah. out there you, you know, you go for all of them, or you know, or, yeah. or treat them all. You know, like, you know, I, I treat all. I I have friends in all the political parties, and you know, but I've I've no qualms about writing negative stories about them if there's a negative story. I've no qualms about doing an interview with them or, and writing a positive story if there's a positive story there. But so it really um, it perturbs me to see some of the younger generation um, behind me, you know, be aren't even trying to mask their political affiliations or or who they support, and I think that's worrying because it undermines. Um, like these are some of them very high profile journalists and it undermines um, confidence in, in traditional media when you know there is so much fake news out there when you have people who don't even try to hide their biases um, and yeah I, I just find that worrying uh, for, for Irish media yeah. well, The opposite of that is when I was elected president of the AJ we were in Romania the following year and they were, there were several camera crews and anyway I, I was invited to be interviewed 
and this guy said to me, you know, what, what was like in your country and, and would you criticise your government? I said, yes, we do roll dice. And he said, oh, would you not be afraid? And the clear implication was he and they would, but they would never dare speak out against their government. So that's the other side. Mm. That's not that hard. Well, that's probably quite any issue. Mm. It's, um, yeah, it, it's very interesting, I suppose, just in, in terms of the... Um, the, the political situation in the UK, obviously, it was a fleeting uh, premiership for, for Liz Truss, and then we had uh, Rishi Sunak, who arrived uh, then afterwards. I wonder, um, do any of the panelists have any views on whether he will bring bring about uh, somewhat at least of a fresh start, as much as is possible for the Tory party um, in Irish-UK or EU-UK relations, or do we need to wait for, for Keir Starmer for that to happen? It's depressing, isn't it, that that's the choice? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, Keir Starmer hasn't done anything to justify being prime minister except not being a Brexit here Tory. And that seems to be enough. If there was an election held in the morning, he'd get an overwhelming majority of opinion polls are to be believed. I mean, it comes back down to Brexit and what Brexit represented. This is the fifth prime minister since Brexit. I mean, I think of Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland. You know, she's been she's been there for five British prime ministers and she hasn't been there an awful long time. And she's been told that, you know, they're not mature enough in Scotland to have a referendum and go for independence when there's a chaos, <laughs> <laughs> places burning uh, throughout England. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, Brexit was ultimately an attempt to make Britain great again. It was very much Trump in the United Kingdom and, and, uh, and, and a nostalgia for a time that most people, if they really thought about it, you shouldn't be nostalgic for. We're talking about the British Empire, essentially. Um, you know, the British Empire disintegrated um, during the time of, Another notable event that happened during the year of the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Mm. Um, if Charles lives to be the same age as Queen Elizabeth II, I would wager a bet that we'll see the disintegration of the United Kingdom. Um, because Brexit was fueled, if anything, by English nationalism, anti-immigration, xenophobia, all the really horrible stuff that we tried to get away with, with kind of the European Union project uh, in many respects. And, and, and this kind of recoiling back into, into a very narrow form of community. And, and what it means to be, be us, and, and not thinking through the implications, not least for us in Ireland. I mean, it was quite clear that not a moment's thought was given to the implications. And, and the opinion polls again demonstrate that Brexiteers or Tory party voters, which was close alignment in many respects, if the choice was between Brexit and an independent Scotland, they'd happily let Scotland go. If it was peace in Northern Ireland or Brexit, they'd happily say, up you go in flames, Northern Ireland, we want our Brexit. So we're in a very strange place because, as you know, for most of our history, there was a, well, I mean, Britain was a place that seemed more progressive than, than, than the policy in, in, in the Republic here. Um, it, it was a place that people emigrated to because it was a better economy. Um, and there was an asymmetry of power there, which has been completely reversed by Brexit. Now, when Britain and Ireland are on the negotiating table, Ireland is there as part of the European Union. And that's been clear when we've had talks about, you know, very important issues for Ireland that we, you know, things like the protocol and things like that, Ireland has got its interests preserved because of the fact that it is on that side of the table. So it's, it's, it's very challenging, but um, I think it's, you know, it tells you how far we've come as well in 50 years. I mean, uh, you know, we only joined the European Union when, when Britain was ready to join or Britain was, they were going to allow Britain to join. Remember, we, we put forward our applications twice and we withdrew it twice because Britain wasn't able to go through because of the French objection under President de Gaulle. Um, now that Britain has left, no one was seriously talking about Ireland leaving. Our place is in Europe. And um, Britain, as I said, they've forgotten the fact that it may have been a very boring um, relationship from their point of view with the European Union, but they trade more with Ireland than they do with China, India, Russia, and Brazil combined. And that's never going to, that's Ireland. Um, so, I mean, when you talk about the European Union relationship, that's the best relationship they're ever going to have. This idea of going around the world trying to find alternatives, it's like some pathetic guy having a midlife crisis thinking there's some better relationship <laughs> around the corner and, and everybody observing saying, what the hell is, it, is going on there? You know, And that's the way we're looking at Britain. It's become an object of pity now, which is a very different Britain from the one that many of us grew up knowing and, and, and uh, as I said, had many positive features to it. Okay, do we have any questions from the room? I see one hand over here, yeah. We'll get you the microphone just so we can get you on the uh, on the recording. Thank you. Um, so I suppose, how much do you feel uh, David Cameron should be taking responsibility for, I suppose, the, the place that the UK finds itself in, you know, five prime ministers down the line? Um, he, you know, some would say he was overconfident uh, at the prospect of Brexit being 
rejected and the UK going on its merry way. I'll defend him for calling the referendum. I just think he handled it really badly. I think it was a boil that had to be lamped. I've been in Europe for years watching poor British officials trying to do their work in Brussels when they were being hampered from home all the time. It has always been a problem in the Conservative Party. So I think he was right to call it, but you're right, he was overconfident. He didn't A, fight for a good enough deal in Brussels, and he didn't fight the referendum hard. Just one quick point on that is, is that it shows you the inexperience as well in Britain with referendum. They should have talked to us yeah. because, <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I've never known a government that's put an issue to the people that it doesn't want passed. And that's what essentially Cameron was doing with Brexit. He was saying, I don't want you to vote for this, but here, go ahead and choose. You know, complete inexperience and amateurism and a really bad campaign, as I pointed out. Okay, do we have a second question? Yeah. Um, I know you mentioned um, that xenophobia was potentially uh, a main factor in why people voted to leave the European Union, but what, how much of a factor do you think that austerity played and the wanting to have a, a vote against the government played? And what lessons do you think that teaches um, the Irish government now going forward in this year with inflation? And I think as, as a side note as well, uh, Robert Reich, who was the Labour Secretary under uh, Bill Clinton, said that every, every time that a journalist mentions that we have the highest rate of inflation since the 1970s, we have to say that we have the highest rate of company profits in over 70 years. Tie those two things together. It's, it's a, just briefly, yep. it's a really good question. And, and um, I think you're, you're right, austerity was a factor. But what, what the Brexit campaign did, and people like Nigel Farage did, is that they blamed austerity on the European Union and on immigration. And they said, if you don't have the job that you want, it's because of the poll next door. You know, he may have a master's in three degrees um, and, and, and two or three languages, and you may just have barely got your A-levels, but, you know, he's taking your job. It's rightfully yours. You're English living in England. And what we've seen is, through the globalization process, is the decline of the nation state. Um, you think back to the 19th century when Marxism started, right? What was Marxism all about? It was creating workers' rights. And, and then by 1945, it was embodied in the state. The state could protect workers' rights. The state is no longer able to, with global corporations and globalization, is no longer in that position because these global corporations, which sometimes have you know, budgets which are bigger than national budgets, can go around and say, if you won't accept our deal, will go to somewhere else. And the same way that in the 19th century, the, the, the factory owner could simply pick employees off one by one. You know, that, that is now happening to countries. But the thing, the only solution to that is to create, you know, cooperation <laughs> among, you know, civil society organizations, among governments, which, the, which is what the EU is trying to do. The EU collectively tries to get, to, to battle against those trends. And that's why Britain leaving the European Union is going to find the workers. That's the great irony. So the people who most, you know, were most passionate about, uh, you know, voting for Brexit in, you know, in these kind of de declining places, the same people, kind of people who voted for Trump, the Rust Belt in America, are the ones who are going to suffer the most, um, you know, because, and, and the Tories who are, who are leading the charge in Brexit are all for deregulation, um, and they're not for workers' rights. So there's, it, it, it's really a tragic uh, situation, but you're absolutely right about austerity. I mean, and 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 about poverty and about all those things. Well, the thing was, is who they blamed. Uh, they didn't blame the government in power. They blamed, as I said, well, they, they they were allowed. The political elite blamed it on the foreigners, and enough of the political um, class or the the voters went along with that narrative. I might put that question to to Patrick as well. But maybe just building on your question, I saw some uh, data recently that I think it was, um, the the median. Um, living standards in the UK compared to Ireland are are thirty percent lower for the for the median citizen uh, in the UK. So I, I wonder, maybe just building on that question, um, is it a case that perhaps the the UK is actually quite a poor country with um, with some people who are quite wealthy? I think the UK is perhaps not. It's it's listened to its own propaganda and jingoism for too long. Um, there was an American State Department official who described England as living its Daedalus years. It had flown too close. To, uh, uh, this was in the 50s after World War II. It had flown too close to the sun and it was starting to fall apart and he just hadn't realized it yet. And of course, he was talking about the British Empire and when we see all the decolonial, decolonialism over the, the course of the 20th century. But again, in some ways, that's still happening to, to, to Britain at home. 
it's not the industrial powerhouse it thinks it was, it, it thinks it is. It's not the global powerhouse it thinks it is. And listening too much, it's still at that Daedalus point. The empire is gone, you know, but it's still flapping away, thinking it can fly higher than it actually can. You know, and I think uh, just to pick up your point, I think that the, the point about the European Union, those international organizations are incredibly important because they are, you know, we came together to form nation states for a reason to protect, you know, I'll leave you to lecture everyone on <laughs> Leviathan, <laughs> you know, and the, the, the same thing applies at an international relations level. And we do need to, and this is why the rule of law uh, at an international level is so important. Um, you know, and I think the, 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 the issue with Ukraine and the invasion of Ukraine highlights some of the challenges of international law in so many different ways. But we can dig into that one another time. But I do see poli some some people here, not necessarily politicians, um, uh, standing next to me in the chamber, trying to exploit that xenophobia and trying to whip it up and trying to stir it up. And I think that we need to remember that you know that solidarity and standing together. And you know Ireland is generally a very generous country. It's a generally a country that stands together. And if people are going to try and divide us based on where we're from or the colour of our skin, we need to call that out and resist it. And I do see some people in the door on this, not, not that explicit xenophobia, but on the edge of it. And, and we're saying some of those, those kind of things that would, would lead me to, you know, those kind of on the edge of those dog whistles that would leave me concerned. But I think, and I, and I think that's something we really need to be aware of. But ultimately, I think, for me, it comes back to, to, to equality, the rule of law, at both at a national level and international level. Just building on that, obviously, and, and some of the, the scenes that we've seen in, in East Wall and other places in relation to Ukrainian refugees and things like that, do you think we're seeing the emergence of a far right in Ireland? Or They've been here for a while. Mm. They were just seeing them. Um, and look, we could you could have a whole event, uh, evening event, digging into that. Um, but they've been here a while, and they're just they're they're pro more successful perhaps recently. But you know, they've already here. Okay, very interesting. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Okay, we'll take two together since we're we're coming up close on time. Yeah. So just on the idea of migrant of worker rights and stuff, and just to go away a bit from Britain to Qatar. Uh, the Economist on the 17th of November have written an article in defense of the Qatar World Cup, and they've written this. The world also looks at mig migrant workers in Qatar through a distorted lens. For one thing, the Emirate is more open to foreign labor than America or any European country. They've also said that whereas hosting the Olympics twice has not made China more democratic, the chance to stage the World Cup has led to an improvement in Qatar's labor laws. So just kind of a comment on that and considering, you know, the more regressive British immigration laws, uh, you know, maybe Qatar, maybe, you know, just to get your overall comment on what the economist said. Mark, maybe to you on that one. So the, the economist said, like, basically, yeah. Qatar has had uh, more chance of reform than China hosting the Olympics. Or... Of Qatar. Well, look, yeah, like, like Qataris are outnumbered in their own country in terms of, you know, there's more immigrant workers. So it's, 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 I don't think that would be repeated in any other country. So the chances if, of, of reform are greater in, the, in there than there is in, you know, the behemoth that is China. Um, but, you know, it, it's the Qataris have a, a tight control on power. You know, like you're not going to have an immigrant worker who can, can be like Rishi Sunak, you know, family who can be prime minister in a, in, in a generation or, you know, Leah Radker in that case. So... Maybe yeah, it's, maybe the chances of reform in a smaller country like Qatar, Qatar uh, are greater. Um, you know, I, I don't see um, you know them reforming their laws on treat, how they treat LGBT people or or anything like that um, happening anytime soon. And I'm sorry, I did say I would take them together, but I didn't. So maybe just yourself, and then uh, yourself, then, and then we will have one more question then to finish. Hi. So this question is for um, Mr. Costello. So. Um, firstly, thanks for taking the challenge against Seda. I'm a law student, so it's really fascinating. Um, I just apologize because now you have like 500 pages of judgment to read. So <laughs> I, yeah, I, feel, I, 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 I do want to apologize to law students in general. I'm a that. bit through the judgment, but I have to read it for my scholars exams in January because, yeah. Um, so you commented on the rule of law and you said that you're quite happy with the state of it in Ireland. 
Does it not worry you a tad bit that said it was deemed constitutional in the High Court and then that there was such a split on certain constitutional issues in the Supreme Court? I think there was a four three split on one of the constitutional issues. Maybe just the, the second question, but yeah, you might have more time then to think about your answer to that one. So, uh, Kira over here. Thank you. It's so a question for um, yourself. So it's a question on trade. So I used to work in international trade. So um, very interesting. Um, what do you think of EU Mercosur given Lula's recent election in Brazil? Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a problem. Like, what would have been nice was if we had had a divisional high court with three judges, and both the state asked for that first, um, and we agreed with them. And uh, Mrs. Just Miss uh, President President uh, Irvine said at the time, "No, if you want a divisional court, you should have given me more judges. I'm. We all know where this is going, so I'm not wasting my judges' time." Um, um, which I had a lot of respect for because we don't have enough judges in this country. So, but look, again, even with Judge Butler's decision, like she found for us in quite a few, quite a lot, you know, so it wasn't a case that everything was thrown out. She found for us in quite a lot. And she, I think, was put in a very invidious position dealing with this huge case. She wasn't on the bench very long. Um, it, it's, it's a very huge case. There was a lot of time pressure being put on us. You know, I think we had four days in the high court and a case like that would normally be given much longer, you know. Um, so I think there was a, I wouldn't worry about about the, the fact that the high court found one way and the Supreme Court found the other, basically, because that's the whole point. And that's, you know, it works that way. Um, Mercosur, this is where I have to start bluffing now. So I'm not, I, 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 look, yeah, there are concerns around Mercosur. There are concerns, obviously, in relation to, from a, you know, a climate perspective, a biodiversity perspective. Um, given the, the, not so much Lula winning, but Bolsonaro losing, I think that's definitely a positive in terms of those, those biodiversity concerns, the Amazon, the deforestation, and all that go with that. Uh, how that's going to actually impact and play out on these things, I'm not going to hazard a guess on that one. Because I think we've got to remember that as well, um, that there's a lot, and this goes back to all our points in relation to, to private companies and all these things, there's a lot of influences around the government and around that, that box them in. And no matter how radical they may appear in opposition or their, how radical their, their motions on a Wednesday night appear in opposition, as soon as they get in, they are going to feel that straitjacket. So how much can Lula stray from this? It will be interesting to see. Okay, um, we are uh, coming up just on time now uh, at the moment, but um, I wanted to put maybe one more question to each of our panelists since we are in the, uh, the festive cheer uh, coming up to Christmas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not about that <laughs> um but uh maybe just to uh well we could cover that but there's lots of other things we could cover as well um but uh maybe just to ask the panelists and i'll move from from left to right with yourself eileen um one thing that you're optimistic about for 2023 oh, um, <laughs> let me ask someone else first. <laughs> okay speak for myself <laughs> For the retirement. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll go with maybe Patrick then first. Um, <laughs> on a party political way, broadcast kind of way, like I'd be optimistic. We have a climate action plan that we're putting the finishing touches to. We've had some good climate legislation. I would be optimistic that we're going to turn a corner and be doing even better in, in Ireland in terms of climate. Um, I'm optimistic as well that there won't be an election because, um, you know, I don't have my posters ready. Um, but I think, I think, look, I think, you know, we have a transition of, of Taoiseach this Saturday. The mood music certainly seems that's going to go smoothly. The coalition will continue smoothly. So, you know, for me, avoiding an election, I think is certainly something to be optimistic for. Okay. Um, and yourself, then, Mark? Yeah, it's, it's nice to live in a country where we can have a, a peaceful transition of power. You know, like a, a, a hundred years ago, you know, um, that wasn't that wasn't the case. So we've come a long way. So it's 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 in in these times where Europe, you know, there's a, a raging war in Europe. It's good to reflect on that. 
Yeah. So on, a, on the football perspective, I'm obviously very optimistic about how the Irish women will do in uh, in Australia, New Zealand, or based in Australia next year. So um, whether their manager will be Vera Pau after the recent news, I don't know. It could be a, another story, but um, they're a great bunch uh, under Katie McCabe. So um, despite all the recent controversies, I think uh, we've, we've reason to be optimistic there. Maybe in the rugby as well, in, in 2023 as well. Yeah, I'm less optimistic there. <laughs> we, we, I, I've got my hopes up before um, a year before a World Cup and uh, seen them dash. So I, we we see we tend to peak. I, yeah. I was in France before for when we we just beat uh, Georgia and Namibia. I still have nightmares about those games. So um, I'm I just worry about us having peaked too soon. Uh, and speaking of France, do you think they'll do the business on Sunday, or do you think it'll be Argentina? I'm I'm I think Argentina will shade it. I think Messi uh, and 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 this guy I'll um. Alvarez, uh, the, the forward is just an amazing player, and so I think that mixture of young and old is, is going to be a little bit too much for um, the Giroud and uh, the rest of the French. You know, you know, Mbappe is still a star. I think, uh, the, I think the Argentinians, you know, they've tasted defeat against Saudi Arabia, and you know, they know this is Messi's last chance. So I think they're just going to leave it all out there. You know, yeah. they wanted more. I, I mentioned Giroud. I, I didn't rate Giroud for years. Um and then he, you know it's amazing how he can be absolutely absent for the whole game and then he just comes up with a bicycle kick a header like you know an unbelievable goal and, and, and amazing hair I'm told yeah. <laughs> he's he's no he said before I can't change that I'm gorgeous is what he said before so which probably epitomizes uh, the kind of personality you really I think that's um, it he stuns the defenders into admiring his physique <laughs> and his hair yeah. um Donica yourself yeah, I've had a lot of time to think about it and I still <laughs> I'm struggling to think of something pretty <laughs> overwhelmingly optimistic about maybe it's because I'm putting too much uh, on the word optimism. I mean, I'm optimistic um, that Ukraine will 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 come out of this this year victorious and and but it's tempered with such sadness that this has happened and and that's why I, I you know when I think of optimism I think of positive emotions and and that's why it, it kind of it seems to eclipse almost everything um, and. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, there'll be lots of, as we all have, little personal triumphs in our lives that will, you know, make us personally, you know, go that little bit, uh, bit of a hop in our step. But I think on a collective level, we have so many things to worry about in the world. <laughs> it's a terrible feeling, I know, to be imparting at this time of the year, but uh, that's still my overwhelming sentiment right now. It's, uh, yeah. Trepidation. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there is. It, 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 it's not a great time in the world, to be honest. Yeah, and well, it's pretty slightly optimistic. Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> we leave it to you to end on a positive note. <laughs> two things, two things. I'm reading Stephen Collins' book at the moment, which is fascinating about the whole way the Irish negotiated our way through Brexit and the protocol. And, and just there are reports coming out now that the mood music is changing because mm. really Irish British relations just hit a, a low in the past couple of years. And uh, even from Stephen's book, Leo Varadkar and Theresa May both kind of socially awkward a bit, just did not, never, never gelled. But th there's a feeling that um, Leo Varadkar and Rishi Sunak will, will get along better. There's also the thing that um, I didn't realise until quite recently reading that book, that when they go to the European Council, they don't have their advisors with them. It's just the prime ministers on their own. And Leo kind of sighs on that responsibility. Now, sometimes he needs to stop before he speaks, but usually he's plain speaking and he can think on his feet. Um, so all of that, I'd be kind of, you know, and with the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement coming up, we'd like to hope and think that we can have it sorted by then. I'm also optimistic about the dubs, Jack and Catherine, <laughs> or Matthew and Bach. Um, so I'd be optimistic about that. I'm for France, I'm from, and if you were an Arsenal fan, you'd be a big fan of Olivier Giroud over the years. Absolutely, yeah. Although, although some controversy when he defected to, to Chelsea, uh, I think that's on as well. But, um, well, thank you so much to uh, our panelists for what I think has been a really, really interesting discussion um, here today and really, really grateful for their time uh, and their expertise. Um, and just to say, you'd be very welcome to, to stick around for a drink. Uh, we have mulled wine uh, for the festive cheer that's in it and some beer and some wine as well. And uh, wishing, I suppose, everyone wishing our panel, wishing uh, everyone in the room a very happy Christmas and a, a safe new year as well. And we'll see you in 2023. So thank you so much.